Amen. Well, welcome. I'm Jeremy, one of the pastors. I think I've already said that once, and I said it again. But uh, I'm glad you guys are here. Um, and uh, thank you for praying for my family uh, over the last week. And um, my uh, grandmother passed away. It was a week ago yesterday. Uh, after um, a week, uh, she had had a stroke on Monday. And um, and uh, we knew that she was going to pass away all week. And so you guys uh, allowed me to stay with my family and minister to them. And I appreciate that. Uh, we uh, buried her on Tuesday. Um, and now it's just the life adjustment. Um, she was a big part of our life, as many of you guys have lost those pieces of your life. She's 86 years old, and so I was lucky to have my grandmother as long as I, I have. And so I just ask you to pray for my family, my mom, my dad, uh, my aunt, um, and uh, those that uh, my grandmother, obviously, she uh, had an impact on or their daily life. Uh, they'd see her every day, talk to her every day. So, um, so that's been a challenge for us, and I appreciate you guys. But I, I was just so encouraged because I'd been looking forward to preaching this sermon for a while. This is probably like uh, like if I was going to you know, measure all of the different sermons that I was going to preach in this series, this was the one that probably was I was most excited about. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about the gospel in our hearts. So we've been going through this series on gospel fluency is what the, the book that, um, that kind of inspired this series, a book by a guy named Jeff Vanderstelt. Um, and it's basically knowing the gospel and, and, and understanding how the gospel of Jesus Christ, the death, burial, resurrection, life, death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how that impacts not just our, our, our one day of our life when we get saved or even the end of our life when we get to go to heaven, but it, it, it impacts every aspect of our life. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, we're going to talk about the gospel in our hearts. How, 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 do we, how do we understand the gospel? How do we preach the gospel in a sense to ourselves and to other people uh, in, in the situation? Situations of everyday life. Before I do that, I want to I want to just give you guys a scenario really quick. What if you went to the doctor with some kind of pain in your body somewhere? It could be any symptom, but we'll start with pain, right? You go to the doctor, you have some kind of pain in your in your body. Maybe it's in your stomach, or maybe it's in your head, or something like that. And so you go to the doctor, you tell him what's going on, and the doctor says, "Here, take this pill," and it gives you a Tylenol. And you're like, okay, I'll take the pill. And you take the pill and maybe it knocks off some of the pain. And you're like, okay, that's good and all. But every time the medicine wears off, I, the pain just comes back again, right? And so you go back to the doctor and say, well, you know, it's, that didn't fix it. And the doctor says, okay, we'll take this one. This one's a little bit stronger. And every time you go back, he just gives you another pain pill to try to help alleviate the pain. Because that's what you have, right? And, or maybe you go in and you have a fever, right? And now it's the pain and now it's a pain and a fever. And so he says, okay, we'll take this one because this will take care of your pain and your fever, right? And every time you go in, he's treating your symptoms and you, and you feel better for a, a season, but you don't feel better long term because he's not really treating the cause of the pain and the cause of the fever. He's just simply treating the symptoms, right? If that was the case, and maybe you've experienced that before, maybe you've been to a doctor before and that's exactly what they did. And, and, and if that's where you're at right now, if you're going, so let me just give you some advice. Find a different doctor, okay? That's some advice. And, if, and maybe if you have experienced that, maybe that is, it was your story, I bet this, the answer to your, your concern was to find a different doctor, right? Because that's unacceptable in the medical practice, right? That's unacceptable in the medical world, right? It, it, because we go to the doctor not necessarily just to, to alleviate our symptoms, I can do that by going to the drugstore and just reading all the different pills and what they, they take care of, right? I mean, like NyQuil, cold, and flu, it takes care of everything. Just take that guy and you will feel no symptoms. Now, you might sleep. Like for me, that Sudafed will zap me out, but... Um, no, wait, Sudaf Benadryl, the Benadryl, that one zaps me out. Sudafed makes me wired. But anyway, you don't need to know that. Huh. Maybe I took some Sudafed this morning. That's why. No, it's coffee. Um, so, but the reality is that would be unacceptable in the medical world, right? Because when you go to the doctor, you're trying to find what's wrong with me. Doctors will run countless tests and run you through numerous scans and get and ask a litany of questions to try to figure out what is the root cause, what is the heart of the problem that you came in for, right? Because doctors know that pain and fever and those things are just symptoms to a deeper problem, right? In the same way, we deal with problems and struggles and sin in our lives. And sometimes we deal with it in the same way as that, that, that messed up doctor would deal with it in my analogy, right? 
We, it, it, we, we deal with the symptoms of the deeper problem rather than actually dealing with and digging down deep and figuring out what is the real problem. What is the real heart issue behind the reaction of this person in anger or the depths of why they're anxious or worried or why addiction issues are in their lives or why whatever it might be, the struggles or circumstances or, 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 or sins of our lives, right? So in, in our world, if someone's anxious, what do we tell them? Well, calm down. Don't worry. Everything's going to be all right. And, and sometimes, I mean, that might fix it for a little bit, right? But then, like, there's a root cause of that anxiety. There's a root issue that's, that they're dealing with. And so that, it'll be all right and just calm down is probably not going to fix it, right? What do we do if someone's dealing with anger? We tell them, chill out, right? That's the worst thing you can say to someone is anger is chill out, right? Because that just makes them more mad. What if, you, what if someone's depressed? We tell them to cheer up, right? We start, start telling them all the things they need to, well, look at this. I mean, yeah, your life, you know, this, you're depressed about this situation, but look at this situation. This is, this is something good going in your life, so just focus on that thing, right? Or, or if someone's unhappy in their marriage, we tell them to suck it up or, or to get a divorce, right? I mean, that's kind of how our, our, our culture sort of deals with it. You know, well, if you're unhappy in your marriage, just go find someone else. That's kind of the cultural perspective. Now, the biblical perspective is suck it up, right? And that's not true either. There's a root cause of, this, of, 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 of the, the separation in your marriage. There's a root cause of, of why one or both of the people in a marriage are not happy. But we don't dig down deep into those things. If someone confesses sin to us, we tell them to stop it. Like the old Saturday Night Live skit, right? You guys might not know what I'm referring to, but just Google it later. You'll like it. It's funny. But we tell them, stop it. Do more godly things. Don't do that anymore. Do this. Well, if it's that easy, I would. I mean, come on, right? But what's the deep down issue? What's the heart issue behind what's going on in their lives? See, we, 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 like the first doctor in my analogy, we often spend all of our time dealing with the symptoms of ours and other people's problems and fail to uncover the source or the root of the problem. So what is the root of the problem? What, what, where is the root of, of all of our sins and struggles in our lives? I, I talked about this a little bit uh, a few weeks ago. I talked about how all of our sin is rooted in, you guys remember? Unbelief, right? We're all unbelievers. We sin because we don't believe something true, something that is true about God. We don't believe something to be true about God. So we pursue something else instead of believing in that. That's going to make more sense as we go through this. Because if you look, let's look down at Matthew chapter 15. If you, if you have your Bibles, turn to Matthew chapter 15. If you don't have a Bible, be on the screen. But I would encourage you to look it up on your phone or have your own paper Bible in front of you so that you can uh, deal with it in your own uh, sort of media. But here we go. Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 through 9. Just, just listen to what G, this interaction Jesus has with the religious leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes. It says, Then the Pharisees and the scribes came to Jesus from Jerusalem and said, Why do, you, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat. He answered them, And why do you break the commandment of God for the sake of your tradition? For God commanded, honor your father and your mother, and whoever reviles father or mother must surely die. But you say, if anyone tells his father or his mother, what you would have, what you have, would have gained from me is given to God, he need not honor his father. So for the sake of your tradition, you have made, the wor the, made void the word of God. You hypocrites. Well, did Isaiah prophesy... Of you when he said, This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus, just to give, help you understand, Jesus is confronted by religious leaders about his disciples not following the traditions of the elders by not washing their hands when they eat. So basically, they didn't wash their hands before they went to eat. And, and, and that's kind of gross. I mean, if you're like today in this world, like it's flu season, you should wash your hands before you eat. But they made it a much bigger deal than just it's gross. They made it a spiritual deal. Like you don't love God and your disciples are not, they don't love God because they're not washing their hands before they eat. They made it a spiritual issue, right? 
So, it was a, so they talked about the tradition of the elders. The tradition of the elders was an oral tradition that was basically a rule book for the rule book. God had, had directed the, command, in the commandments. He had told them how they are to live. And the, <clears throat> and the direction of those commandments was how are they are to live in order to have a relationship, in order to have fellowship with God. And so they, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, have created this oral tradition, which basically says, if you want to follow God's law, you better follow this law law. And so they're saying to Jesus, you don't make your disciples follow the rules that they're supposed to. Do you feel somehow like you're above these rules, Jesus? So for them, they said this, these rules, that these traditions, these oral traditions, these traditions of the elders, they're as important as the commandments that God gave us. But then Jesus, in his typical way, he answers their question with a question. He says, why do you break the commandments of God for the sake of following the traditions that man gave you? See what Jesus does there? He says, listen, your traditions, those oral traditions, <clears throat> you are more concerned about following those than you are about the heart behind following the commandments of God. See, he points to the specific instance. See, in the oral tradition, they say something, someone can ignore the needs of their parents if they have committed their financial means to God, which nullifies the honor your father and your mother, which is one of the Ten Commandments. See, what they were doing is basically they would say, hey, mom and dad, it, part of that honoring your father and mother in that culture was that when your parents got older and they couldn't work and, and earn money, that you would take care of your parents' needs. But if you had committed your, the, by the oral tradition, if you had committed your money, your, your finances to the Lord, you didn't have to honor that. So Jesus is saying, some dude told you to do this, and so you've totally neglected what God told you to do. And he calls them hypocrites because of that. They're stomping on the toes of the disciples while they're also nullifying, at the same time, nullifying the word of God, making it void. See, Jesus points out a major flaw of the religious leaders. They were deeply concerned about following the law, but had altogether missed the purpose of the law to connect with the Lord. And Jesus understood and unveils the problem of the religious leaders had. In verse 8, he prophes Isaiah prophesied, he points this out. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. See, the issue is not that they are, are doing bad things. That was not the issue with the Pharisees and the scribes. They did everything right. The issue was with their heart and their motivation behind it. See, they saw the relationship with God as kind of a give and take sort of relationship. I do these things for you and it makes you happy, God. Rather than understanding that the law was a way for them to get connected with God, they were trying to prove themselves to God. The issue was when in their heart, Jesus goes even further, and he says in Matthew chapter 15, verses 10 through 20, he says, he, and he called the people. So he wants to, edu to talk to the people about what he's just talked to with the Pharisees. He says to the, he called the people to him and said to them, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a person, but what comes out of the, uh, out of the mouth, this defiles a person. Then the disciples came and said to him, Do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard, you say, or heard this saying? I just want Jesus to say, I don't care. But he doesn't say that. I mean, he probably could say some pretty harsh words there, right? But he says, he answers, Every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be rooted up. Let them alone. They are blind guides. And if the blind leads the blind, both will fall into a pit. Jesus basically says, don't worry about them. I mean, God will root up who is really, truly understanding of who he is and those that don't, right? And he says, do you not see that whatever goes into, or so he said, are you, uh, uh, sorry, but Peter said to him, explain the parable to us. And he said, are you also still without understanding? Do you not see that whatever goes into the mouth passes into the stomach and is expelled? I don't really need to go into detail on what that means, right? You guys kind of understand what that's talking about? Check with somebody that knows anatomy a little bit better and they'll talk to you all about that, okay? But basically you eat stuff and it comes out, right? But what goes, comes out of the mouth proceeds from the heart and this defiles a person. 
Listen to what he says next. For out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual morality, theft, false witness, and slander. He just names a few. There's a lot of other things that comes out of our heart, right? And these are what defile a person. But to eat what un with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. See, Jesus explains that what he is saying to the religious leaders, to his disciples. In summation, he says, what comes out of your mouth is not the source of the problem. It is where those words and where those actions and where those thoughts and where those intentions, where they originate. What you put into your body is not the problem. What comes out of your body isn't necessarily the problem. It's only a symptom to a greater problem that's deep inside of our hearts. See, it's, it's the same place. The heart is the same place that our thoughts, intentions, desires, and motives all come from. What you say and what you do are the fruit of the deep roots that exist in your heart. Jesus says, for out of the heart come evil thoughts. The thoughts that you think, the evil thoughts that you think, they're not a product of somebody else. They're a product of what's going on in your heart. Murder. Now, Jesus talks about murder early on in Matthew, and he says that murder, if you're, if you're angry with someone and you wish ill will on someone, that's the same as murder, right? And so when he's saying that, like your intentions and the way you feel about other people and your anger and bitterness towards other people, that's coming out of your heart. Sexual morality, the way we view sexuality, the way we, uh, we, we practice sexuality, whether it's sinful or, or, or whether we, produce, we, we practice the ways of this world or the ways of God, that comes out of the heart. Are you saying that I will do whatever I want and no one's going to tell me any different? Well, that comes out of your heart. Theft, false witness, slander. These are what defiles a person, but to eat what is unwashed with, with unwashed hands does not defile anyone. If we are to speak the gospel to those around us in a way that speaks good news into their lives, and if we are to live our everyday lives in the freedom and forgiveness the gospel provides, we have to understand that our sins and our struggles are rooted in deep, in, in, in our heart deeply. And we are believing lies in deep into our hearts. See, because at the end of the day, the root of all of our sin and struggles is unbelief. And unbelief originates in, a, in, in our hearts, according to Jesus. See, the, the Pharisees, they didn't believe in that Jesus was the Son of God. And they didn't believe that God would come in the form that Jesus came in. And they didn't believe in God's graciousness. Even in that, like you could see, like their, the way that they related with God was, it was entirely based on how well that they performed. It was performance based. If I did good, God was happy. If I didn't do good, God was mad. They didn't understand the grace of God. That's one of the reasons that Jesus came, is to, to show us the grace of God. And so, how do we understand this gospel in our hearts? If, if we don't believe the gospel, and that's the source of our sins and struggles, how do we get down to the nitty gritty? How do we know what the roots of our unbelief are? Well, in, in, I want to share with you four questions. These four questions that we must ask are not four questions that we must ask once in our life, but four questions that we must ask every day of our life and multiple times throughout the day in our life. When we are struggling, when we have sin in our life, when we are dealing with unbelief in our life, we need to ask some questions in order for us to figure out how we are to traverse this landscape of unbelief in our life. And so these, these questions come out of Jeff Vandersell's teaching in, in the, in the uh, in Gospel Fluency, the book Gospel Fluency. And they were revolutionary as, my, as I understand how how to, un how to counsel people, how to share the gospel with people, and how to understand my own sinfulness and to overcome my sinfulness. Because when I'm sinning, the last thing that I need someone to tell me is, stop doing that. I know I need to stop doing that. But where, what's the heart? Where, where is it coming from? Where is my sin coming from? So these four questions, I'm going to go through these questions, and then we're going to circle back and understand these more at the very end of my sermon, okay? So first off is this. The, question is, the first question is, who is God? 
who is God. If we're going to understand where our sinfulness comes from, where our struggles come from, we have to understand who is God. Now, when I say struggles, I, I should clarify that I'm not talking about like, like the struggles of the world around us. It's really how we understand the struggles of the world around us, right? Because we're going to deal with loss. We're going to deal with, uh, with, with, with pain and suffering and all those things that aren't necessarily things that are inside of us, but are outside of us. But it's how we deal with those struggles, right? Are we anxious? Are we fearful? Are we worried? Are we angry? Are we uh, whatever it might be? How we react to the struggles around us, it says something about what we believe about who God is, right? So looking at this, who God is, is the question of theology. When I say the word theology, most of the people in the room would think seminary professors and pastors, that's all who really deal with theology, but the very word theology kind of goes against that very idea. See, the word theology means the study of God or really the understanding of, of, of God. And so everybody that has ever existed from the very beginning of creation to the very end of creation has some form of theology. If you're an atheist, your theology is God doesn't exist. That's still a belief about God. That's still an understanding of who God is. If you're an agnostic, you might say, well, I don't really know if God exists. Well, that's a particular understanding of who God is. If you're a Hindu, you believe that God exists in multiple beings, and so that's a belief about God. That's your theology. If you're a Muslim, that you believe in Allah, and that's your theology. If you're a Christian, you believe in the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and, and Jesus, his Son, came to earth. Like All those things are theology. And so it's not necessarily a particular thing that we don't have to deal with. But see, a theology, what we believe about God, shapes our actions, our motives, our desires, and our decisions, and our identities. All of those things are shaped by what we believe about God. See, let me give you an example. If I believe God is distant and uninvolved, then I will likely not concern myself with what He thinks about the decisions in my life. If I believe that God isn't actively involved or, 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 or in the world, like that God isn't present in the world around me, that God, and, and that God isn't necessarily involved in my life, then I, when I'm making decisions, I, I'm not going to necessarily care what he, whether, whether he, what, what he thinks about the decision I'm making. I'm not going to pray. I'm not going to seek the word because God is just this distant being who created me and he's not actively involved in my life anymore. In the same way, if God is distant and uninvolved, he probably doesn't care particularly about the lifestyle I'm living. So conviction and all those kind of things aren't things that I'm looking at because God is this distant being that doesn't care about how I live. He lets me decide how I live. And so you see where our belief in who God is. See, and this is the thing. If you were going to dig down deep, many of us live like that. We might not confess it, but every day that you live, you decide whether or not God is actively involved in your life or not. Because if you don't pray and seek his understanding on decisions that you're making in your life, then you think, well, God doesn't care about this. He's not actively involved in it. You never say that, but that's how you're living. If you think that God, you know, well, God's loving, but then you don't necessarily... Like you can't express how God is loving in your own life or you don't like when something goes wrong, you kind of think of God as this mean guy in heaven who's just looking down at you and saying, I'm just going to make your life really bad. You can say you love God, but your actions are speaking something totally different. So the first question is, who is God? The second question is, what has he done or is he doing? See, what we believe about God will determine how we understand what he has or hasn't done or what he is or isn't doing. So, give me, let me give you an example. Do you believe God is active or has been working in your life or even in human history? Do you believe God is active in your life? See, this is where theology meets action. If God is love, then how is he loving if God is gracious, then where is his grace being shown or given? Adversely, if God is an angry jerk, then he is probably causing much of the calamity that is in your life right now. See, if you believe some, something, if you believe God is an angry jerk and something bad happens in your life, you're going to translate, that's God doing that to me. You see how your theology educates what God's activity is. If you don't believe God is present, 
then you're not going to acknowledge His presence. But if you believe God is loving, then you're going to see what He did on the cross in Jesus. That's an expression of His love towards you. Third question is, who am I, uh, who am I in light of God's work? So what we believe about God and His activity impacts our identity in dramatic ways. If I believe God is loving and has shown His love for me in Jesus, then I can view myself as loved and as valued. But if I see God's love as conditional I must per, and I must perform well to receive it, then my identity is, what's going, to be, is going to be based on my performance. Let me talk about that just real quick. So if you believe that God is loving and the greatest expression of his love is in sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for your sins, then your identity is I am a beloved child of God. We just sang about that just a second ago. So if you're a beloved child of God, your relationship with God is not dependent on your obedience. But if your understanding is God only loves me if I perform well, then your identity is based on how well you're performing at the particular day or particular time of your day that it is, right? So if I'm having a really good day, then God must really love me. If I'm having a really bad day, then God must really not like me at all. See, what we understand, who we understand God to be and what he has done for us and in us will decide and will dictate how we view ourselves. And thus, what should I do in light of who I am? Then how we actually act and how we think and how we, we the motives of our heart, right? So this is the fruit of belief. The outworking of our beliefs. For the Pharisees, Jesus was speaking to their hypocrisy as the fruit of their corrupt hearts. Their relationship with God was conditional based on how well they were performing and they were doing really good. So they were hip hypocrites because they were pointing out all the bad in other people when actually they were the ones that were breaking the laws of God. See, how we live and make decisions and what we are feeling and, and what we value are the fruits of what we believe. So... Going back to that first question, I want to just spend a little bit of time uh, answering something that I think is important for all of us. And we're going to circle back and do a little bit more on this later uh, at another day. But I want to talk about the four foundational truths we must believe about God. If we're going to start anywhere in this process, we can't start with all these things are bad. You need to stop doing those things. We've got to start with the root. And the root is, what do you believe about God? So... If you're going to imagine a tree, I'm going to uh, try to do something in a second, but if you imagine a tree, uh, and at the bottom of that tree is the root system, right? And that root system, whatever that root system is, is going to determine what the fruit of the tree will produce, right? So the tree will produce apples if it's an apple tree, right? If the root system is an apple tree, then it's going to produce apples. I don't care what you do about, but you cannot create an orange tree out of an apple tree if the root system is an apple tree, right? That's just how it's going to be. So in the same way, if the root system, imagine who is God is at the root system of our lives, right? And so there's four foundational truths we must believe. The first one is this. The first is this, God is good. We've got to believe that God is good if we're going to understand, um, if we're going to understand um, the depths of where our sinfulness comes from. Let me, let me talk about this. So God is good. So we don't have to look somewhere else for satisfaction or fulfillment. What I mean by that is when we are looking for something else to satisfy us, to fulfill us, what we're basically saying is, God, you're not good enough for me. We look to porn, we look to sex, we look to drugs, we look to alcohol, we look to entertainment. See, when we make the pursuit of pleasure or satisfaction the driving narrative of our lives, we are not believing God is good enough. So when we are ultimately believe that the temporal pleasures we are seeking or indulging in is, the ultimate, is ultimately better than God, at least in the moment that we're making that decision. See, every moment that we decide to pursue something instead of God, we're saying that thing is better than God. That thing is going to bring me more pleasure and more joy and more fulfillment than God will bring. See, God is not enough for me. So what you believe about God is God some kind of killjoy. That God is just not the, the place where you're going to go for happiness and pleasure and joy. 
I'm rather going to go look at this on the internet or I'm going to go watch this and, 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 and I don't care what it does to my mind or whatever. I'm going to go pursue this person because, or I'm going to, uh, to give myself over to this thing because it's going to provide me with pleasure. And all the while God is the only one that's good enough to satisfy us. Second is God is glorious, so we don't have to fear others. See, the word glorious means big, grand, and awesome. It points to God as bigger and more grandiose than anyone or anything else. And so when we don't believe that God is glorious, then the approval of people becomes the God we serve. Do they like me? Are they satisfied with me? Am I worthy of their attention? See, when we don't believe God is glorious, then we believe people are glorious. And they start to become gods in our lives. And we will do anything to serve those gods, to make them happy, to make us valued in their eyes, to get their attention. You see that in teenagers all the time, trying to get the attention of a dude or trying to get the attention of a girl, right? I mean, they'll do anything just to get their attention, to be valued, to be loved, to feel satisfaction and pleasure. And what they're doing is giving themselves over to that person as a God. That person has become more glorious to them than God. Number three, God is great, so we don't have to be in control. This, is, this hits home for me big time. How much do you, th let me just ask you this. How much control do you think you have? How much control do you think you have in, in any aspect of your life? But particularly, how much control do you have in, with your children, with your family, with your job, with your health, with your relationships? How much control do you think you have? Let me just give you some perspective. The world we live in is perfectly placed within our solar system to sustain life. If we were any closer to the sun or any further away from the sun, life would be very different and possibly it wouldn't be existent at all. If the world, if the earth spun faster or slower, it would drastically influence the life that we have on earth. Not only that, we are a part of an infinitely expanding universe that no human being can even imagine, let alone see. And though the universe is beyond expansive, right now our hearts are beating, our lungs are breathing, our brain is sending out impulses that are prompting everything in our bodies to function. And this whole intricate and, in, intricate and yet vast system we live in is beyond imagination and beyond our ability to manipulate, beyond some small advances in understanding, and yet God holds the whole thing in the palm of His hand. So, so if God is great enough to handle the universe, don't you think He can handle the struggles of your everyday? When we don't believe that God is great, then we make ourselves into the gods of our own universe where we think we can control everything around us. And that really is at the heart of anxiety. See, when we're anxious about something, what we're basically saying is, ooh, God, I don't know if you can handle this one. Now, I know I'm simplifying anxiety, okay? I know that. But when we're a lot of the root of much of our anger is based on this as well. I'm angry because I don't have control of the situation. I don't have control of this person. And so I'm angry. I'm anxious. I'm worried. I'm fearful. Because does God have control? And what we're saying there is I don't believe God's great enough. I believe the world that He created is now out of His control. We would never say that, but that's what we're believing. See, we don't, we don't have to be in control because God is great, and we need to believe that. The last one is finally, is God is gracious, so we don't have to prove ourselves. See, what do you look to for validation, for a sense of worthiness and acceptability? Do you look to whether or not people around you are impressed with you or satisfied with you? Or do you have a deep-seated desire to prove yourself to yourself? Are you trying to prove yourself to others or are you trying to prove yourself to yourself? You don't feel validated unless you accomplish what you wanted to accomplish or do what you feel like you should be doing. Or when you fail, you feel unworthy like a loser. 
or maybe for you, it's uh, you are you're on a continual pursuit to prove yourself worthy of God's acceptance. It might be a combination of all of these, right? Because that worthy of God's acceptance, like if but by doing all the right things and not doing bad things, then God would be happy with me. So if I have a good day, then God must be pleased with me. But if I have a bad day, then he turns his face away from me. See, regardless of who you're trying to prove yourself to, your efforts to validate yourself, to justify yourself, are clear evidence that you do not believe that God is gracious. Almost every time I pray, I thank God for His grace. And it's a reminder to myself that God's grace is not something that I have earned or something that I have the ability to destroy. I've received God's grace through faith. But I, I can't boast about that. I can't, and I can't say that that's something that I've earned. It's simply something that has been given to me. Because of my faith in Christ, the grace of God covers all of my sins. Romans 5.1 says, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's God's grace in me. Later on in verse 8 he says, uh, he says that even while yet I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. His love has given me grace. Not because I've earned it, but because he has given it freely to me. God is gracious. That's who he is. So I want to just go through something real quick. Johnny, let's see if this works. Oh, it worked. Sweet. Okay. So my daughter did not draw this. Okay. It was me that drew this. I just wanted to give you guys a real quick illustration of what I'm talking about when I'm talking about this root to fruit kind of thing. So if you look at this, if we just take the, the idea of anxiety and worry, if, if someone, if you are experiencing anxiety, worry, or fear, what is, that's the fruit of something deep down inside of you, right? And if we were going to go through these questions and we were going to start from the end and work our way uh, 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 we'll start from the, the end and work our way to the beginning, what we would do is kind of look at it like this. So the first question we would ask um, would be, um, I need my notes. So the first question we would ask really would be, what am I experiencing? And that's where this is going to come from up here, right? So what am I experiencing? Oh, this is not going to, what am I, this is bad. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's really bad. But anyway, I'll, I'll try to get better at that. So what am I experiencing? I'm experiencing worry. I'm experiencing anxiety. I'm experiencing fear. And so then, what do I believe about myself? So this is the question of identity. What do I believe about myself? So if we're kind of following this chain, if I'm experiencing anxiety, fear, or worry over circumstances in my life, I believe that I am in control, right? So if I believe I'm in control, the reality is I'm not in control, and that's why I'm experiencing worry and anxiety and fear, right? Because even though I think I'm in control, the reality is I'm not in control because God is in control, and I want to be in control, so I'm anxious because maybe God it doesn't really know what he's doing. And that would lead us to our third question, right? Our third question is, what is God doing Oops. I gave you some space on the back of your sheet to write this down if you want. You might be saying, Jeremy, just move on with this, but just bear with me. I've been excited about this all week. <laughs> but what is God doing? So if, if we believe that, that we're in control, then what we believe about God, what God is doing is that we believe that God has lost control. Because of our anxiety and our worry and our fear, I believe I'm out of control even though I think I'm in control. And we believe that God is ultimately out of control and that he has abandoned us and turned his back on us in this situation. And so that's what's prompting this fear, the fear of the unknown, the fear that things are out of control, the fear that things are going to, to blow up in my face, right? The fear that my kid is going to make a bad decision and ruin his or her life for the rest of their life. The fear that that little kid that's making fun of my kid on the playground is going to ruin my kid's life for the rest of her life. 
So then who do I, who do I believe, um, who do I believe that, uh, that um, sorry, I think I missed, do I believe about myself? I believe, so going back one, I believe that I am God of this situation as well. And then number four is then ultimately, what do we believe about God? So we're going to do, sorry, who is God? So we ask this question, we're, we're, our answer to this is that God is unloving and uninvolved. And that His power is not sufficient to handle the situations of my life. And so if we're, if we're tracking through this, what we're doing is we're following the fruit to the root. And we're confessing our sin of unbelief and the, and the process through this, right? So if we go over here and we follow it back from root to fruit, we're basically going to ask the same questions. But who, God, who is God really? God really, we know from the Bible that God is loving. That God is present. That God is powerful. So then, if we believe that, then what is God doing? Well, He is saving us. His power is, is, all, is, is working in us and around us. That He is present. And if we believe that, then who am I? I'm a loved child of God. I, am, I have the presence of God living inside me through His Spirit. He is ever-present in my life. And if that's the case, what am I experiencing? Well, I should be experiencing peace, rest, joy, and hope, right? Because if, if that's the case, and I hope that translated well, um, it, it worked well in my mind. Whether it worked well in reality, I'm not sure. But see, if God is love, and He has shown His love in sending His Son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins, then He has actively shown, my, shown me love, which makes me see myself as a beloved child of God who can speak to my daddy, and He knows who I am. And he hears my words and he, he is actively involved in my life, right? And so if, if that's the case, then what should I do? I should rest in him. I should hope in him. I should pray boldly and confidently to him. And I should believe that he will work in, in me and work everything out according to his will, which is the best thing for me. So at the bottom of your sheet on the back it says this, the gospel is always good news. It's good news to those who are believers today. It's good news to those who are not believers today. And maybe you, you don't believe it, but I would encourage you and challenge you to, to consider how good God is. And how loving God is. That He could have left us all as sinners to die in our sin and, and to spend eternity in hell. But He didn't see that as an option. He gave us the option. He, he, he came to, to earth to die for us that we could have salvation. And He is a good God. He is a great God. He is a glorious God. And He is a gracious God. See, if, if you're a believer today, your biggest need is to know and to believe and to live the gospel as we've talked about it today. What are the implications of the gospel on your struggles, on your sins, and on your circumstances of your life? But see, the gospel is also for the unbeliever in the same way. See, your problem is not, is, 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 the problem that you're dealing with is that you don't believe in the God of the Bible. You don't believe in His Son who came to, to save us from the brokenness of this world. So your first step towards fixing the brokenness in your life is not to live a better life. It's not to do more good stuff. It's not to do less bad stuff. It's not to come to church more often. You need to meet Jesus. And you need to, to, to be introduced to the creator of the universe that came to earth to rescue us from our brokenness and, 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 and to rescue us as unbelieving sinners. And you need to surrender your life to him today. We all need to surrender our lives to him today. We need to, to believe in who he is, who he really is. 
We need to understand what He has done for us in Christ Jesus and who that makes us to be so that it will change our motives and our intentions and our desires and our emotions day by day. See, the journey of discipleship, the journey of coming to know Jesus, the journey of following Jesus is just a journey to understand how, how He impacts every aspect of our lives from our parenting and our relationships and our workplaces and all those things. He brings them all into, into conformity to His Son. That's the goal of our lives. So my invitation to you today is simply this. If you've never trusted in Jesus, I would ask you to, to consider today. Maybe for you, it's, this, it's, 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 it's been this journey over the course of a few weeks and, 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 and maybe a couple months. And you've had this sort of like feeling in your heart that something is not right. Something is broken about your life. As Andy talked about last week, maybe you've been following this alternate story that has ultimately not brought hope and peace and rest into your life. And you're realizing that that story is the wrong story to follow, and yet Jesus' story is becoming more and more sweet to your ears. The story of redemption, the story of hope, the story of peace that comes through trusting in Christ for your salvation. And so today you just need to submit to Him. But for those who are believers today, my challenge to you is to believe the gospel and to live it. To take my broken analogy, my broken, my, my kitty drawing here, and just to let that sink in this week. Who, who is God? What has He done? And who does that make me be? And how should I live that out in my everyday life? Let's go to Him in prayer right now. Lord Jesus, thank You, God, for Your grace. God, thank You that Your grace is sufficient for us. Your grace is sufficient for me, God. God, it's transformative. It makes me into something that I'm not. Your grace changes me from a sinner to a saint. Your, your, your grace changes me uh, from a slave to sin to a slave of righteousness. It changes me into, from hopeless to hopeful. It changes me from broken to restored and redeemed. Changes all of us, God. And so, Father, I pray that that would be our story, Father, that we would see the struggles and the sins of our lives as opportunities for us to believe in you more fully and for the gospel to work in, in, in and through us more completely, God. Help us to be people that love your truth, that love your gospel, that love your good news, God, because it continues to transform and change us and make us new. God, for all those in the room today, Father, that may not know you as Lord, maybe they have, have toyed with the idea, maybe they've, they've entirely been rebellious of the idea altogether in their lives, Father. I pray right now that you would break their hearts and lead them to repentance that you would lead them to confession of their sins and a transformation that would begin in their hearts today, Father. As you, as you transform their hearts from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh and they receive Jesus as the Lord of their life, God. May you move in our hearts in this moment. God, help us to respond in whatever way you lead us today. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Let's stand together.